All right, so welcome to our professional development series. I am Keith Koo. I'm on the board of the Asian Business League. Uh, we've been doing a series of professional development workshops, and this is our third. Uh, this is being presented by the Asian Business League the National Association of Asian Americans Professionals out of San Francisco and the Asian Leadership Alliance, a affinity group of uh, Asian employee resource groups. And we welcome you. To find out more information about any of our organizations, please check out any of the websites below. So today we're talking about salary negotiation. Don't leave money and benefits on the table. Uh, this is with Jenny Chang, who is the head of recruiting for Zillow Group and a professional coach, and also Pyle Berry, and she's trademarked this. She's the epiphanist. Uh, we're going to have a great time today talking about what's involved in salary negotiation and the emotions and the psychology behind it. So I just wanted to once again welcome Jenny and Pyle. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having Hi, us. Yes. So uh, I wanted to start off with getting to know both of you. Why don't we start with Ginny? Yeah, this wasn't planned at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> first of all, um, for those that um, have loved ones that are directly affected by COVID or most recently the hurricanes and fires, we hope there's been some relief because I know this is not, you know, this is something that's still on top of our mind. And thank you, Keith, and the other organizations mentioned for hosting the third professional development series, I will say that the first two webinars um, were great and are tough acts to follow. So I hope um, all of you will connect with both of us later on LinkedIn, and there you'll find sort of details of my professional journey, but I usually prefer to share something that's not on my LinkedIn. Um, so very quickly, when I decided to attend the University of Washington, I wanted to live on or near campus like most students. And uh, my parents said no, since technically I was able to commute to school in less than 45 minutes. So it made sense to save money. But I negotiated with them to let me find a way to afford it without letting my grades slide. So um, my solution was I actually found a job as, a, as an apartment manager, three blocks from school and got free rent for the next couple of years where I kind of got to party with my tenants. So my learning was, I, you don't have to settle not the worst to get a no once in a while um, because it could turn out better than you imagined and in my case I was able to leverage the experience of managing apartment complexes at the age of 18 on my resume so thank you for joining us today wow I did not know that I known Jenny a little while. I did not know you were a slumlord <laughs> so a pile um, we'd like to get to know you a little bit better yeah, thank you again for um, having me on this with Jenny. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I actually have, um, I'm a, my background was a, as a former clinical therapist and I worked in New York and I literally lived off of like $40,000 in living in Manhattan. And I thought it was such an exciting raise. And I thought I was so rich when I got uh, promoted to like $46,000. And I thought, wow. Oh, I'm making it here in, in the big city. Um, but then I, you know, as I was working as a clinical therapist, I was spending a lot of time focusing internally about looking at the retention levels and looking at what was happening within our organization in the nonprofit setting. And that kind of drove me to realizing how much I really love uh, leadership development and learning development. And that led me into corporate. And so that was also an interesting transfer of going from being a clinical therapist and trans transitioning into corporate America and again, knowing how to take those skills and show them because there's always that question of how did you make the bridge and the crossover. But as I made that crossover, it really was um, looking at the, the psychology, psychology as like how that's a fundamental of it. And so as I was working in global leadership programs and building that, I ultimately ended up um, having a strong passion towards women of color. So now I focus specifically on coaching first time female leaders um, and specifically women of color to make sure that they're raising their confidence and really removing those narratives that have been taught to us from a very young age um, so that they can really feel deserving of that position. Got it. Thank you. And I'm just curious, how did you come up with trademarking the epiphanist? 
So, uh, you know, as I was trying to figure out what it is that I do, and as I was coaching a lot of women, there was a lot of like aha moments. And so as we're thinking about that, our entire life, and as we're moving through, you know, our journey, what, where we achieve every goal is because of these aha moments, we build our resilience through them. And so that's where it was like, I'm your epiphanist. I help you reach your aha moments in order to like remove those blocks and move forward. Thank you. So right before we get started with the questions, tonight's format is a fireside chat with Ginny and Pyle. Uh, questions can be directed to Ramon Tran on private chat, or you can put it in the public chat as well. And if we have time at the end, we'll get to those questions that um, as we have free uh, more time. And then also for those of you who have not been in one of these before, we do a networking session for the last 30 minutes of this um, session. So if you haven't been one in been in one before, I encourage you to stick around because they're great. So with that, we'll get on with our first question. So why is it so important yet so hard for people to just ask for a raise? And I'll start with Ginny. Um, by the way, I have a jar for any time somebody has to tell me I'm on mute so I can put money in it. So maybe you can help me get some extra money from this event. And, um, and also, sorry to interrupt, uh, please prompt me when I should be starting our poll. Oh, you know what? Why don't we do the poll first? Okay. Let's do the poll first, just so that we can get to know our audience very quickly. The third question is a trick question. I hope yeah, everyone supposed to be the end. Sorry about that. on yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll keep it open. It's about another 30 seconds. Sure. And maybe I'll just start while we're waiting for that. Sure. Um, so since this is an event sponsored by several API organizations, I'll start with two stats that we, I feel like we need to change pronto. So the first one is that API men and women are the least likely to negotiate salary or promos. I'm guessing most people are not surprised by this stat. Um, and the second one, which is more timely, we also have the lowest voter turnout. Now we can't solve the second one, but maybe we can try to work on this um, first one. Um, are we waiting for the poll results or? Yep, I got them. Okay, cool. Go. Ooh, 96% will negotiate next time. I think we're done, Pal. Yeah. I think we can, we can wrap this up. <laughs> Fantastic session. Fantastic <laughs> session, yes. And it looks like, um, okay, so we got at least 50% rarely. So at least you're doing some, and wow, 37% 37, 37 already are doing it. So for those that actually clicked on 37%, um, please feel free to just jump in the chat and share your experience, share how you did it, what was, you know, how did you overcome your fear and, and to share with us, because we are definitely not the only, um, I guess, experts in this area. Thank you, Keith, for the poll. Yep. Okay, so why is it important or why is it hard? Um, I, think, I think we assume good intent, uh, that the dream companies we wanna be a part of will be fair, but salary ranges is what it is. They have ranges and while their intent is not to lowball candidates. Um, with 19 states and 21 local cities that have banned employers from asking your salary history, now you can just focus on what you should or want to get paid, like without the baggage of what you think you were getting paid uh, before. Um, the cost of leaving even just 6% on the table means it'll probably take you about two years to catch up with the average 3% annual raise. And even if you do get a promo during this time, you're still behind because it's often a set percentage of your salary in adjustment. So, and let's be honest, um, this is an area that uh, Pyle and I are very passionate about, is if the current status quo is working, we wouldn't need to talk about pay gaps or pay equity for women and BIPOC anymore, as women are still being paid 81 cents to every dollar in men and minority women averaging even less. So I would say the ironic thing for me is the most fearless negotiators we have that we can actually look to are the kids. So 
There's a reason why I suddenly have an adopted shelter dog back uh, as of May uh, after several rounds of negotiation with my daughter. She was fearless. She didn't care about no. She just kept up the ante and gave me better reasons to negotiate. And, and basically she did, she did win. So at some point, I think um, we just started to lose and suppress those skills and figure the risk of getting told no is just not worth it. And I know from a psychology point of view, there's probably more than that. So I'll pass it on. Well, well speaking of psychology, that's where I think Pyle has a lot to share on this topic. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think that the first thing and where people get a lot of um, anxiety around talking about money is because you have to think about how were, what's your background? How were you raised? Um, you know, really talking about money and what was that like in your family? So if you look all the way back about, you know, whether it is that you came from a well-to-do family or you came from a family where um, there was a bit of struggles, you either way, you have to think about like, was there good conversations around money or was it that you know oh you're a child we're not going to talk about our money stuff in front of you and we're going to protect you from it so where does your relationship with money start from and it typically is from your home and your background the environment that you're in so when you start to actually look at that and address that and look at like how do I uh, think of money? How do I value money? What do I consider this to be? Then from there, you can start addressing some of those, those, um, those anxiety provoking moments around what does it mean for me to ask for this? And also thinking about it from a cultural perspective, you know, the Asian community in general, and I can say for South Asians, and especially as a woman, you know, you're never taught to talk about money. That's uh, rude, it's insulting. And also just thinking about it as a, when you're coming from a more collective culture, um, and it's really, um, hard to put yourself as an individualistic person and say that I am valued at this. And so those are some things that you want to think about and also consider that, you know, just there is unconscious bias that does exist. And so when you're even thinking about that I'm coming in as a woman and coming in to negotiate my salary, there's already an expectation that a woman is not going to negotiate more than one round. So how are you going to either play into that or recognize that and actually be able to shift that conversation with them? So that's something to think about is really starting with what was it like for me growing up and what is my relationship to money? Did we lose Keith? <laughs> Should we just start our own show? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Well, Pyle, um, <laughs> how has the COVID situation changed the negotiation game or just like job search in general? Um, you know, I think that like, as we've talked about this before as well, is that there's still a lot of companies that have, um, that are still doing really well, that are thriving. And so when you're thinking about negotiating in today's time, you do want to think about things like, well, right now, for example, a lot of organizations give stock options as, you know, a part of the overall compensation. And if the stock options aren't as strong right now, like let's just say it was $40, $30 right now, well, you can negotiate that. And you can still look at it from a long-term perspective of like, what would my pay be, you know, overall, if I'm going to be staying with this organization for two, three years. Um, also just thinking about, you know, um, with COVID being in place and with everyone working virtually, that's not always going to be the case. So you want to think again long term about what are the factors that you want to have included, whether it's they should pay for my Wi Fi while I'm working from home, they should cover my expenses of paper, pencil, if anyone ever uses that anymore, but like, you know, whatever it is that you're getting that is office supplies, like, and, um, there should be some kind of expense that is um, allowed for that. That's something else to consider is that what are you doing, whether it's even maybe getting a co-sharing workspace. So because you can't work at home because you've got your kids, you've got your new dog that, you know, just like Jenny just got, and you've got um, a husband or a significant other or roommates that are working and you need to go out and work. That right there can also be something you can negotiate. What about you? What do you think, Jenny? <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually agree with you know all your points and I'll just add a couple. Um, I do think that some of the trends is what traditionally been known as like the stable or large companies maker that wasn't 
it, it's suddenly hot again because many have seen they've been you know able to withstand this crisis so far and they haven't had to lay off people in fact they're still you know hiring um, there's also positive signs that are coming back in industries that we thought um, would be affected like travel and I know someone Mabel is from Airbnb but you know they just announced that they're back in hiring uh, back with hiring and they brought back some of the recruiting team members just to support the growth so and and not forgetting you know there's still growth companies where you know their company or service that's helping people work smarter in lieu of face of face-to-face interaction will continue to you know experience growth and in the people org space um with racial injustice and momentum happening this year it also meant like a surge in commitment for uh, lots of roles related to diversity and equity and inclusion, you know, internally. So what this all means is that we should assume companies and industries will recover, will continue to hire, and there's no, re no need for us to assume their lack of budget or their constraints until they reveal it to us. Yeah. HD. Yeah, go ahead, pile. And I, I apologize, I had a power outage, so. Oh, oh, wow. wow. That's amazing, but please go on. <laughs> well, um, I think we actually just covered a couple of the questions, so <laughs> we That's just great. took over. We only covered one, but yeah. uh, the next one, go ahead. It's, uh... All right. Well, what is a good mental health hack uh, you might suggest, and how, does com how do companies know the best range for these roles? Um, I like so what... learn from Pyle. <laughs> Well, one of the things that I was going to mention, I was going to refer back to again, like that relationship with money is that, you know, when you, because there's this like awkwardness or this nervousness, especially if you've never done it, um, start practicing ahead of time, you know, and that means like start practicing at home. You know, if you have a child, like Jenny said, like, honestly, practice with them and be like, make them, you know, whatever you want to negotiate, start trying with them. Try with um, stores, with coffee shops, wherever, like asking for deals online. Like it's literally making yourself comfortable with first having those conversations around, can I get a deal on this? Can I get, you know, what would it be like if I could get 20% off from here? And being able to feel comfortable talking about it, I think that's like step number one and um, addressing if there is a block about even talking about money in the first place. Um, and then the other thing is that when you are having those conversations, it's to start early and, you know, to find, to really align it more with, this isn't a money conversation about, you know, necessarily like me as a woman or me as this, but it's like, align it to your competencies, you know, like what is it that this organization is looking for and what value am I bringing to them? When you talk about it from the angle of like, I am worth this because this is all the accomplishments, everything that I'm bringing to the table, that will change your dynamic of how you talk to yourself. Ginny? Yeah, um, yeah. and in addition to really knowing your, uh, you know, your own skill set, what you bring to the table, it's also looking ahead and kind of around the corner of what this company what they might be facing, what challenges that, you know, you can help solve. Um, but I do think just quickly there, we already have some type of ritual that works best of us for like nervous uh, scenarios. So like before a big presentation, an important client meeting, uh, having your partner meet your parents for the first time, like all could have like consequences and pushback. So, but what they have in common is like, you don't go in without a plan. You know, you don't go in feeling comfortable and confident in, in the things that you want to talk about. So once you start with the gratitude of the offer, but plan on just not accepting any initial terms without thinking about what else is on the table um, and which ones are most important to you. So you have plenty of time once they, you know, give you the offer. That's good to know. Usually uh, this is just, um, they give a sense of urgency on how long you need to actually respond to. No, I mean, they may give you, you know, let's say a two week window or even at best a one week window. But the truth is, that means that you still have time even within your first 24 hours to review that offer once they give it to you um, and actually set that tone. Now, if you know, if you've done some research about what the company offers already, like their benefits or the extra things that they do, then you might already have an idea prior to the offer of what things are going to be important to you. 
How do companies set their ranges and how do you know that those are valid ranges? I feel like there should be some recruiting folks on, on this call. But there I'll are a lot of recruiting folks they in this are? situation, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good for people who are recruiting, you know, here are some good talent to coach perhaps. Um, I'll just give like a high level um, uh, overview because uh, most established companies update or at least review their salary ranges annually. And one way the compensation team is they use the market compensation data from industry sources like a Radford, which focuses on like high tech for global sales or Mercer that focuses on financial services and all the others to compare the compensation relative to a desired benchmark. So for some companies, they're not trying to meet on a one-to-one -one basis. There's always gonna be companies that pay more. So some companies may decide they only wanna go for the 75th percentile compared to most of their competitors in terms of compensation. But then what they try to do is round out with other benefits um, to create more of a comp like a competitive total comp. Um, and, and finally, there's always usually a minimum, a midpoint, and a high range to, to give employees the time to grow within that level. <laughs> Keith, Keith was so moved, so shocked by what I just said. Um, yeah. Okay, well, why don't we, um, I guess maybe, I think the next one's really about like, what was the differences? We talked a lot about like salary negotiation, but mm -hmm. really there's two folds because once you're, you know, in the company and you want to grow there, there's the asking for the raise or promotion. So maybe we can start there. Yeah, definitely. I think that like when you're internal, you know, there's a lot of those mental blocks again that come around that, oh, well, you know, if I ask for something that's a little bit out of range, then, and if I don't end up getting that job, then how's it going to look on me, my reputation, um, you know, and there's a lot of like a worry more about your image because you are internal than it is about the other factors. And so when you're looking at, you know, a promotion or getting a raise, you want to, again, have those conversations starting six months earlier. Like when it has like, even as early as your performance review the year before, where you're talking about what is your goal and objective for the following year? Maybe it is that I'm looking to transfer from, transition from being an individual contributor to a, in a leadership position for the first time. So what does that mean? And so starting to have conversations with your um, boss about, you know, talking about your accomplishments. Again, moving it always forward with, um, this is what I've done so far with the organization. These are the things that I've, you know, brought to, um, with, with what I've done in the last few years working here. And this is how I see myself growing with the organization. And when you continue to focus more on what it is that you are adding value with, then that is going to ultimately lead into that conversation of um, talking about money. The other thing is that, it's always great to have some form of a mentor, someone who is a senior that is either in the um, organization or maybe external as well, but asking them that like for this particular role, what can I expect? What should I, with the responsibilities that are gonna be added on, what should my range be? And starting to learn about what that is and talking about what you should negotiate in your contract ahead of time with someone that you really trust. I, I don't have anything more to add. I, I, I do realize the best way to do your salary jump is still oftentimes going into a new company. Um, so if you didn't negotiate when you, before you accepted your, this current role, you are slightly behind, but that's where your performance and your uh, future impact um, for the company um, is going to be even you know, more important. Uh, does, is Keith back? If not, we'll just continue. Yeah, let's just keep going. <laughs> okay. It's the Indian pile show. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. So what are some maybe, I guess we should talk about like some unique ways to research and prep. The, the, the fact is after um, the end of panel, we're going to flash up a resource list that you can screenshot, meaning um, just like most common things, some resource that you can use and take away. Um, so maybe we'll just talk about like other tips um, that yeah. we can think of. Um, and I'll just share a few. So um, I would say the first thing is 
the reason why you want to know a company's performance cycle, like how many times they do it and when they do it, is to help um, you learn when is the next opportunity you will be discussing your impact and salary. So companies often have like cutoff dates um, for this uh, for any prorated performance equity based adjustment. So let's say you joined in you know late September, you may have to wait until end of 2021 to dis discuss it if they only do it once a year. So if you actually know that information, you can go in and use that as a negotiation tactic and actually say, you know, I understand your review is not going to happen. I kind of missed the deadline, I believe. Um, so I would like to make sure that I um, you know, receive the most um, competitive salary range. And I think it actually will impress them that you actually thought about that or that, you know, you're basically problem solving in some way. Um, uh, I don't know who's a fan of blind. Do people use blind? Okay, so I would say this is the app where people anonymously share company information. Sometimes that includes salary information. So I would just say they're oftentimes missing, they're part of the puzzles. So um, take it with a grain of salt and it should not be your only uh, source of truth. So I'll pause here and let Pyle add on. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit it on the nail with a lot of really great, uh, you know, tips and stuff. The one thing that I will add again is just, um, you know, a lot of times again with it, it's like the imposter syndrome, like why does that even happen is because you don't have the knowledge or the information around it. Imposter syndrome is typically like you're feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm faking it. Someone's going to find out I'm not worth this. But really when you do your research and really going off of the tips that Jenny shared, as well as... Um, do your reading based off of industry specific, you know, like even if you may have a certain role, but then in a big five versus um, government versus nonprofit versus um, a small startup, a tech company, there's still going to be differences in that salary range. And so you want to not just look at the title, but you also want to be very specific to the type of industry and the type of, um, you know, grouping that you're in. I would also then again, really, really highlight talking to somebody who's a senior executive that is in that industry that you can trust and say to them that, look, this is my responsibilities I'm looking, looking at getting. This is the type of role. What do you think? What is the range that I should be looking at so that you don't lowball yourself and you don't also like, you know, knock yourself out of the park? Yeah, I'll just add one more if you're an internal person. You're not looking for a job, but you're kind of thinking about internally where your movement is. So um, I would say consider reviewing your original job description and level, presuming you haven't been promoted in between that time, and see if there's any, been, uh, been any substantial job scope changes that you've been successful at. In other words, not a stretch opportunity because you wanted to grow, but it was something they trust you enough to give to you and you have shown some results on it. And that's a good way to actually show, you see, when I was getting paid for this, I was asked to do this, I have exceeded this, and I've added, you know, X, Y, Z. So that's another way to show that, because um, maybe your manager or skip level doesn't remember all these things um, because we move, you know, in a fast pace. Mm -hmm. One other thing, actually, I just realized and remembered is also that when you are internal and um, look at, you know, find out what your competitor is paying. And if there is a direct competitor and what the title or the job or the responsibilities are, and if they're, if someone in that position is making twice as much or they're making 1.5 as much, you know, really bring that to the attention saying that, you know, as I was trying to like do my research and really review what is appropriate in the benchmark, um, I realized like our competitor is actually offering this much. So what could you do to sweeten the deal? So it's again, always leading with your value as a, what you're bringing through with your competencies, your accomplishments and focusing on that versus saying things like, well, I just deserve it. Or, well, you know, it, it's a bump in title, so I should get the money. You know, it's really bring, bring forward with you more of those, um, the backing of like the ROI, the benchmark and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I actually found out a few Zillow folks was joining and what I said to them is, if you learn any you know, nuggets here, just say Pyle gave you all those nuggets when you go negotiate with your you know, manager. <laughs> all right. Uh, um, Keith, are you back? I, I'm, okay. I'm back. And it is affecting my whole neighborhood. So if I, if oh, I get disconnected, if I get disconnected, the backup is uh, Kevin C. who has graciously offered to continue on. 
and uh, he, he knows what to do. But, you know, one thing, because I thought about you know, my, my 20 plus year journey in corporate before starting my consulting firm. Here's a question for either of you or both of you, title or money? Oh. <laughs> Depends how long you plan to be there. Yeah. And if you're using it as a stepping stone. Um, so I'll, get, I'll use a good example. There's probably a lot of high level exec titles um, in the banking industry. So within the banking industry, if you stay within that, people understand what that level means amongst each other as they move around. Um, it's only when you decide to go from a bank industry to maybe a different corporation, then they might adjust that kind of title. So I guess that's what I'm saying is it really depends on if people know what type of company that is and what that means in terms of your actual job scope. Um, yeah. Well, actually, you didn't ask, Keith, you didn't say how much the difference of the money, though. So that, that could make a difference, too. Yeah. Well, I, I, if I may, um, can I share my experience? Sure. And Linda just shared one, too. Oh, great. Well, let's, let's read Linda's first. <laughs> you said money. Money. She can, I can she always, can change, always my title. change your title. <laughs> <laughs> I well, love that. I like it. Well, I think it's good. You know, I, I've actually worked in both banking and technology and, and finished in banking. And I think it's a good point that uh, without knowing context, certain titles can perceive to be inflated or can be perceived to be out of whack. So I'll just specifically talk about the tech industry. Um, I w worked a long time in a company that I won't mention right now, but you can look it up on LinkedIn. Uh, we were notorious for under titling. And so we didn't get the title, but we got the pay. And so you can tell that as people from this company, especially during uh, .com, post.com era, when they left our company and went to other companies, their titles went up significantly. It also works in reverse. So if you go for the title and you're significantly gapped between what the pay would be, then you might experience a title deflation or a mismatch there as well. So I think it's better not to go for either necessarily as a, as a one and done, I think it's actually be strategic about what your actually your short term and your long term goals are. Because sometimes uh, if you're not doing a lot of due diligence, you might price yourself out because the title has some preconceived idea. I think it speaks more to actually what your job scope and your, your actual job content was. And so when you go through an actual live interview, you can actually speak to that experience and that will generally set what the the recruiting manager or the hiring manager would think about it, your actual experience. Yeah. And again, we shouldn't be asking your past history pay anyway. So we can make some assumption, assumption when you negotiate with us. Well, not, not, you know, yeah, not the salary, but yes. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to add real quick also that I think what you pointed out, Keith, was really important is thinking about your long term. So, you know, I actually have a peer that I used to work with way back in the day. And um, he, we were in a electric company that we worked at and he actually took a 40% cut because he went to Netflix right after. And Netflix turned into Amazon. Amazon turned into Google. And he is now making more money than he could have ever imagined. And so sometimes you have to think about, is taking that pay cut at first worth it for what your long-term trajectory is for your career? The other thing is that as you're thinking about your title increase, it's really, again, aligning it with like, what is your purpose? What is it that you want your your career to actually be reflective about, you know, are you really gunning for that C-suite executive position or are you looking at your time in corporate as, okay, this is just my time in corporate, but ultimately I do want to be an entrepreneur and I'm looking at where do I build the most amount of skill sets. And so based off of that, I think it's really just goes down to First and foremost, you need to have a strategy in place of what is your long-term career goals. Having pivots, of course, that might change, but um, is the, the title more important in that sense or is the money more important from that sense? Yeah, and I think that's a great way to talk about our next topic is beyond actual hard dollars and pay. What are some of the other things that people should think about in negotiating. I'm a professional negotiator for deals, technology deals, companies. Um, but in terms of putting that lens on, I think like I'll, I'll give an example for people who are familiar with procurement or supply chain. You know, you're normally trying to get to lowest unit cost in a negotiation. Salesperson trying to get the highest. 
but there's so many things that get missed in a negotiation. So translate into, into your personal career. What are some of the other elements that people should be thinking about beyond the base pay? Um, so one thing I can add well to that question is that, you know, a lot of times you go in and you think about, okay, well, I've got my health insurance covered. Well, this is the amount of days that they give as vacation days. So that's what I'm going to take. Well, no, you can actually uh, negotiate all of that, you know? Um, so for an organization that I used to work for, when I got that job offer, I got two job offers on the same day. One of them was offering me 30 days paid vacation. The other one was 12 days, which was vacation and sick days included. So uh, the one that was giving the less vacation days had the higher salary and the base pay was actually like $25,000 more. But what I, when I talked to them, I said to them that, you know what, like having more time off is important to me because I live extremely far from my family. I'm here by myself. So I need to have that time to travel. I need this, I need that. And they actually upped and matched the uh, vacation days. Um, so, you know, thinking about that, the other thing is that um, if you're in grad school, a lot of organizations are offering, of course, like student reimbursement, things like that, tuition reimbursement. But what you can also ask for is that Beyond that, you want to take some like professional development courses or conferences that you want to go to. That isn't always in the budget, especially if you're not at a leadership position. So that is something else to ask for is that, look, I'm extremely passionate about this career. I'm passionate about growing myself here. So could we add a budget for me to be able to take a certain amount of professional development courses um, and you know certificates or whatever going to conferences in the year? You can add things like that with, especially with now with um, thinking about, you know, uh, if you're a working mom and saying that, you know, I need to have Fridays off or I need to be having a flexible schedule that I need to work around. Um, those are certain things that you can definitely push forward in your negotiation. Thank you. Jenny, do you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. Anything that's on the table, what I mean is anything that they've listed as if benefits or the total comp package, whatever it might be, it is um, up for uh, negotiation in the sense that the worst they can say is no, but, but it is negotiable. Um, but let's, let, if we just kind of look at like what's happening with COVID situation is that it's been devastating. And if there's one thing now you can do is actually, you know, peek behind the curtain and to see which companies have stepped up or missed the mark completely when it comes to dealing with COVID and supporting their employees. Because again, long-term, you're not just looking for a job, you are looking for, yes, the package is great, but is this the company that you wanna you know, invest in the time and will they be able to take care of you? So um, even if there were companies that during the hard times, they had to, let's say, lay off or furlough some employees, not not all of the experience or the severance package um, was the same. So like if you Google certain companies, they've done a really amazing job to create a community to kind of help the people they had to let go for the time being to help them find jobs. So knowing what type of companies um, that are doing that is, is important. Um, so, you know, if you know, uh, if you're a current employee, you know, you're not negotiating, but you're thinking, wow, with this remote work, I'm, you know, considering migrating to another state. Um, this is your chance to find out about your company's plans. It may take a while because it's still flowing, but they may decide, for example, a grace period where they won't change your base pay based on location and cost of living while we kind of just like wait this out and see kind of what happens. So that's more from a COVID, um, you know, things to think about. No, that, that's, that's really good advice, Pyle. Sorry, uh, the other thing I wanted to actually add as well is with everything that's going on uh, now with BLM or with the fact that organizations are starting to step up with their DNI efforts. One of the things that that's actually um, going on with that is that people of color are stepping into those roles more and they're also feeling the exhaustion from it, the trauma from it as well. And so, you know, there's a lot of affinity groups that are associated with organizations and you have people of color that are joining those. Now, 
if you are someone that knows that you're passionate about the DNI space, you know that beyond just your actual job responsibilities, you are going to be contributing in those ways, don't look at that as volunteer. Look at that as the fact that that is also something that you're adding to your plate and that you're adding to the organization's growth and to ultimately their entire reputation. So that is another negotiating power is saying that like, you know, this is something that I'm also bringing to the table. This is also how I'm going to be supporting the organization. And for that, you can also be compensated. Yeah, and just a couple of anecdotes. And Ginny, I know that Zillow is actually one of the innovative companies that are saying that they're not gonna adjust anything for some period of time. So hats off to Zillow. Yes. I know for the Airbnb folks on that, um, I just interviewed on my radio show, Steve Cadigan, who we, he and I worked together at a really large tech firm and um, he became the first head of HR for LinkedIn. And we talked about what a great job Airbnb did. And he actually posted on LinkedIn a few months ago for setting up, um, the, it mean basically turning a huge amount of their HR team into an outplacement. Usually we hire an outplacement service, they turn their own internal team into an outplacement. And we both talked about how that's like a, a model for many companies going through this. So I think it's really relevant. I think it's a really stressful time. So um, thank I you. And one more thing. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, this this current situation, people have been calling it a she session, so a recession, but she session, because there's a, a, a surge um, or increased percentage of women that are losing their, their jobs. Um, uh, whereas in 2009, when that happened, it was very, it was, was it called men's session? I don't know if it was the, called that, but it was in reference to all the you know manufacturing jobs and all those changes. So for those that are actually even working, we we still sense that not all of it. I think it's getting much better, but there's definitely like as a caregiver, um, there's this, there's sometimes an imbalance. So even looking for companies that are willing to give um, caregiver time off or as much flexibility for the long term, these are things you know we should be asking as not, not a negotiation, but even almost a right to ask. Well, thank you. So I'm going to, we have about 13 minutes left in the uh, session before our networking session. And I wanted to get into some of the audience questions. So um, we, we've developed quite a list. So we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, one is what are the top two salary negotiation mistakes that you've experienced, both of you? Or either. Uh, I it? guess the first one would be not negotiating at all, right? That's what I'm seeing, you know, if you don't do that. The second one, I believe there was an audience member, Erica Yamada, where you mentioned um, you worry about repercussions or like women who like lean in negotiation actually experience negative uh, repercussions. Um, I think it's going to depend on the, you know, the how you approach. So if you're as as if, if you're approaching it more objectively, some of the things that Pyle like mentioned, it doesn't um, like, like basically we can't always control some of the unconscious bias that happens. Uh, we know we haven't solved. There's no silver bullet to like solving um, equity or you know all the topics that we talked about. So the thing about this to me, I guess the mistake would be if you asked once, but they didn't give you a good reason for saying no. Right. So objectively, if they're coming back to say, listen, you know, based on this, we're not giving, let's say, bonuses to anyone because of COVID times, that's an objective reasoning. Right. But if they just say, nope, for no reason, I think then it's okay to ask again or or pivot to say, well, if what would be negotiable if I can't do this, what's another way that would, you know, kind of make our situation, you know, a little bit more, you know, equal footing. Thank you. Yeah, I think the one thing that I would add also is um, you don't, when you are negotiating, you want to make sure that you're not saying it as a this is it or else. Um, when you are approaching it, let them know that, you know, uh, this is what I'm considering. I'd love to hear back instead of saying, this is what I really want. And, you know, this is what I like, this is, this is all that I'm going to essentially accept because when you're saying something like that, they will come back with saying like, all right, well, if this is not going to work out, then goodbye. So you want to make sure that the language that you use as well is saying that like you're open and you're talking with negotiation or just like, this is something that you're thinking about, not a, this is the only thing that I will accept. Great. 
Um, this is an interesting question. And this has to do with if somebody receives a higher salary at another company, should they ask for a counter offer at their existing company or not? Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's actually a survey that's, um, that I can't, I don't know if I found it, but basically the survey question was actually uh, uh, the, asking the people who would uh, tell the company that, that they have a you know competing offer, but they really don't. So in essence, lying. And um, apparently 39% um, in, in that survey would, I'm not creating a judgment, I'm just sharing a data. <laughs> well, that's a super dangerous move if you don't really I have the, agree. The, the, <laughs> unless you really have the inclination that, that you would leave your company, um, that's, yeah. a, that's a pretty risky yeah. strategy. Got it. Any specific strategies that would be different for negotiating salaries for a nonprofit? So I think with a nonprofit, what you want to do is, first of all, and I think this actually goes, to be honest, with um, any organization, is you want to try to get the recruiter to actually give you the range. <laughs> so, you know, you want to be, you know, say it honestly that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm really interested in this position and, and really, especially with nonprofits specifically, if we're talking about them, is that nonprofits are very purpose driven. So if you are going to be focused on the um, money aspect of it mostly, they might actually be turned off by that. So what you want to do is really bring in the fact that you're really aligned with their purpose, you're really aligned with their passion of what they're trying to, their causes are. But then overall, you wanna ask them like, you know, I really am curious to know what is that range that you are looking at? And within that range, um, you can give a number. And I would also suggest that you do it somewhere where it's 15% or less is what you want um, to negotiate. What And what they're gonna do is whatever your lowest number is that you've given, they're going to counter with something that's 5% less of that. So you want to think about um, that range from that perspective or talk to them from there. And the other thing is with nonprofits is, um, you know, talk to them about the fact that in my, my previous position, this is the job that I had, and this is what I was in and so as i'm moving into a new position with you guys you know and the responsibilities that are here this is what i'm expecting to have and i think nonprofits are a lot more open to talking about um salaries and the other thing is that there's actually a website i'm totally forgetting it right now and i could share it in a minute once i'm not talking um, if i look it up is that because it's a nonprofit, you're actually able to see because legally they have to um they have to show what the salaries are of certain positions. So based off of the nonprofit that you look at and you and you see what the executive, the leadership team is making at that organization, you can probably estimate what it would be like in your position that you're moving forward in. Got it, thank you. I'm, so go I'm not gonna add more, but um, I'm gonna share a link on uh, some of the tips, but it's probably the link, different link from what you just mentioned. Okay. So here's a question. Is it ever possible or do you recommend trying to get a hold of the final decision maker when you're negotiating a salary? So like basically bypassing recruiting and just going straight to the, the hiring manager? Um, I think if you have the connection, this is where all like referrals and the networking, this all comes about it. There are definitely uh, different entryway into the process. I do think um, leveraging the decision maker or the hiring manager um, to at least get your, um, you know, application in, right? So, because oftentimes we get hundreds of applications. Um, I think that's a good way to do it. I don't know if this is the question about sort of bypass because I think recruiting will always be involved in that and also compensation team is involved. So there's definitely um, always a review of what the internal equity is ahead of time. Now, if you're working with a startup CEO and you're like BFFs with this person, I mean, that's a whole different story. But traditionally in companies with processes, with, you know, um, generally there's, it's a partnership between compensation, recruiting and the clients. 
Thank you. I really love this question. I was guilty of this myself when I was a younger career person. Um, how long is too long to wait for your next promotion or job? So assuming that you know, you're qualified, you've done everything you're supposed to be doing and you're sitting in place, how long is too long to wait before taking action and, and doing something else? I think the younger generation actually has the opposite problem. Um, I think that they're more in a hurry to be like, I've, I've been here for a year, so why am I not getting promoted? Um, so, or they're ready to jump. And of course, you know, I think that nowadays it's really more, and Ginny, please let correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like, you know, two years in a position is almost what's become the more natural trend of what's expected for someone to stay in a role. Yeah, I would just add, um, it also depends where you are in the level. So obviously in more junior positions, that timeline of career progression should be shorter naturally. Um, a good company should give you uh, at least a framework of what the different roles are but they shouldn't necessarily give you like, oh, this is a two year thing and here's a complete checklist and this is what's gonna happen. So um, I would say that's part one. So the higher level you go to, likely the time to wait for those roles um, might be different. I would say if you are um, more interested in like learning and you really love the company, sometimes doing a lateral move to career pivot or add on different responsibility gives you a better overview, sort of like, like the next role. So for example, if, you, if your goal is to be a chief people officer, not only would you necessarily need to know about recruiting, you might need to learn more about HR, um, HRBPs and um, the L&D world or operation. So sometimes, depending on where your value is and how much you really see this company, that's important. And the last thing I would say, you should know where you stand from performance reviews, whether or not you're on track. So it's not about years, right? It's about, do you know what it takes for, to help you get to the next level? Or are you stuck because your performance is um, in their eyes um, average, right? Like that depends as well. Uh, here's a question that is, well, it'd be interesting to hear what um, Pyle or Jenny, how, sh how you answer. Should I go for a contractor role or a permanent role? Mm. So I've done both. And uh, to be completely honest, I prefer contractor. Um, and the reason is you actually do make significantly more than when you are a uh, internal in certain positions in certain ways. Um, of course, you know, you have to take into account that you're gonna cover your own health insurance, things like that, but there's a lot more flexibility. Um, the, and again, it really, I can't preface this enough, it really goes back to what is your end goal? What is your strategy and for your career, but also thinking about what are your responsibilities with your family? You know, like, do you have to have stable health insurance? That might mean that being internal is more important. Um, if you are on your own and you can take those kind of risks, then I say, go for it, do contract work. It allows you to be a little bit more flexible in terms of the projects that you're taking on. You're able to, um, you know, act a little bit like a consultant where you can go in have a project or have some work with an organization, you have an end date of six months or five months, and you can even sometimes work two contracts at the same time. So it allows for a lot more flexibility. There is a lot of agencies and organizations out there that can bring you on into their system so that you don't necessarily have to do the BD work, you're just going in and doing the work itself. And that way it's really up to you and you in a way work for yourself without working for yourself. Um, so I do think a contract job is great. I've always loved it and now I work completely on my own. And so it's um, fantastic. But if you require, if you need a little bit more of that stability, you like a little bit more of that structure because the one thing contract work is, is that you're constantly on a hustle. You know, it's not that jobs are just gonna come left and right. You have to constantly network and constantly be out there. Um, when you are internal, you're getting a little bit more of the stability in terms of the paycheck every two weeks, you've got the health insurance. And again, I would say that think about it from the strategy of what you want to do and contract work sometimes allows you to get more work that you wouldn't necessarily get if you're internal. So it actually also expands your um, resume as well. Thank you. Ginny? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll do a different point of view of 
um, what it may mean from a recruiter that's looking at your you know information right so is it more career hopping or is it like you continued you made the choice of actually doing contract work i will say for um sort of long-term internal roles are great for people who want to see year over year progression and year over year like uh you know results that are amazing that they help push they help make that impact um you know in terms of the growth of a company or um just new initiatives they got to work on so some, so I would say I've done both too, and I actually like both. Um, but I, I would say it really depends again um, where you see the value of like what you're getting out of it. All right. Well, with that, we are actually out of time for the fireside chat. So I wanted to thank both Pyle Berry and Ginny Chang for being here today. Let's all give them a big hand of applause. Put the hands. And then uh, I, they did have a resource to share. Hopefully my computer survived. Somewhere. Um, let's see. Okay, so we will get this out. This is a resource list for everyone with a, a lot of different links and everything like that. So we will send that or make that available to everyone on here. Um, I did want to quickly mention that our next event is going to be on October 21st with Darlene Chu Bryant, Executive Director of Global SF. She's going to be talking about navigating change during a pandemic. So be sure to sign up for that.